Hello, I'm Mike Penny, and we're into study three of this series of looking at God's will, past and present. We've looked at the Old Testament, which is predominantly to do with the Jews, obviously, and we've also looked into the Gospels to see what God's will was for the Jews during the time when our Lord was on earth, and we've also looked at the Acts period to see what the will of God was for Jewish Christians by looking at the letters written to those Jewish Christians during that time. Letters like Hebrews, uh, James, 1 and 2 Peter, 1, 2 and 3 John. Now, in this study, we're going to look at Paul's letters, which he wrote to Jewish and Gentile Christians. What does he have to say about the will of God in those letters addressed to churches, which were a mixture of Jewish and Gentile? Christians. Okay, now the Paul's earlier letters written to the Jewish and Gentile Christians were Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Uh, do they have much to say about the will of God? <clears throat> First of all, let's read 1 Thessalonians 4. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to do this more and more. You know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's will that you should be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live holy lives. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit. So he, he starts this section off by saying, We've instructed you when we were with you, because Paul spent some time with the Thessalonians, how to live in order to please God. And they were doing it. They were doing a good job, it seems to be. However, they were asked to urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to live it, to do it more and more. And he then goes on to say, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. God's will that you should be holy. OK, fine. If you want to be holy, therefore you should avoid sexual immorality. You should learn to control your bodies in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust. Now, many of these uh, Thessalonian Christians were Gentiles who uh, came out of that immoral pagan society. But some of these Jewish Christians, as we did last time in Peter's letter, he wrote to the Jews scattered abroad in certain places and we had found that some of these had lapsed into the behavior of pagan gentiles so this may well have applied to both the jewish christians in thessalonica as well as the gentile christians in thessalonica they are to avoid sexual immorality they have to learn to control their bodies in a way that is holy and honorable not giving into passionate lusts they also should not wrong brother or take advantage of a weaker person. That's what was happening in some places. James wrote about that, about the how certain uh, leadership of the Jewish community were taking Jewish Christians, poorer Jewish Christians, to court. So God did not call us, as he says, to be impure. God calls us to live holy lives. And that is how you live a holy life. That is how you are sanctified. You know, that's what that's what we should be. OK. And so in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, he comes back to this. Look at what he says here. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the tim timid. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. 
make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong but always try to be kind and to each other and to everyone else be joyful always pray continually give thanks in all circumstances for this is god's will for you in christ jesus so if you what if what was the will of god for these jewish and gentile christians the book of acts is to have high regard for christian workers it's to live in peace with each other it's to encourage the timid it's to help the weak but we have to be patient with everyone and do not pay back wrong for wrong if somebody wrongs you forgive them be kind to everyone be joyful always pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances what a wow this is the will of god he says this is the will of god for you in christ jesus well there you are very clear very simple to understand maybe not so simple to do but you see the will of god here is all to do with our behavior and our attitude their behavior and their attitude let's read uh, 2 corinthians uh, 8 1 to 6 right i know brothers we want you to know about the grace that god has given the macedonian churches this is the grace that in which they gave a fair amount of money for the collection for the poor in jerusalem out of the most severe trial their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity for i testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service of giving to the saints and they did not do so as we expected but they gave themselves first to the lord and then to us in keeping with god's will so we urged titus since he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of giving grace on your part but just as you excel in everything in faith in speech in knowledge in complete earnestness and in your love for us see that you also excel in this grace of giving ah there we go so the will of god here was giving to the poor the macedonian churches had excelled in it and the, the corinthian churches seem to be doing pretty good at the moment and he commends them for it and asks them to you know increase their giving for the poor in jerusalem okay so that's an interesting aspect of the will of god to give money for the poor let's turn to uh, romans chapter 12. what did we read there in verses 1 to 3. therefore i urge you brothers in in view of god's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to god which is your spiritual worship we often think about worship what goes on in church but hey this spiritual worship is offering your bodies as living sacrifices living a holy life and doing what pleases to god do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world see they they had they are terrible temptations in this pagan world yeah, and we have terrible temptations in the world we live do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what god's will is his good pleasing and perfect will so what is it well it's to live holy and pleasing lives it's not conforming to the pattern of this world it's that's that's what it is it's clear this would enable them to test and approve god's will for themselves and see it was the best way to live their lives as we have said earlier on if the jews kept the law of moses not only would their personal lives be better the community life would be better and as a result everybody's life would be better if they lived in accordance with god's law and it's the same here he's telling these people you know it's the best way to live your lives but again notice all this the will of god was personal moral character 
that's what God is concerned about. He's not really concerned primarily with what job I do or which house I live in or which church I go to. He's more concerned with the type of people we are. Now let's look at Romans 8. Going to Romans 8, verses 26 to 28, it says this. Romans 8, 26. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, we do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. I, I, really, I really know that. God works for the good in the life of those who are called to his purposes. But here we have basically the Spirit intercedes on our behalf yes many times we know what to pray for but sometimes if we see a family member or a friend or a neighbor and they got such problems uh, we don't know what to do to help them we don't know what the problem we don't really fully understand the problem and, and we don't know what to pray for well we just pray we still pray for them it's, it is as simple as that it's as simple as that that's what we have to do and it's god's will for us to just pray, even if we don't know what to pray for. <laughs> Think about that. Now, in Acts chapter 20, Paul is concluding his third, third ministry journey. Uh, he, he, he's, he's left Corinth. He's gone back up to the churches of, um, of Macedonia and coming back. And he calls in to see the Ephesian elders on his way to Jerusalem with that gift for the poor that we mentioned earlier. And um, it's a rather moving passage if you read all of it. And we've done a YouTube video on this. Um, it's to do with the speeches in Acts. And if you look at the speeches in Acts, this is the speech Paul gave to the Ephesian elders. You might like to watch that video. Anyway, um, let, let's read from verse 25. He says, Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching this kingdom will ever see me again. Paul, Paul thought he would never see them again. His plan was to go to Jerusalem and then off to Rome and then off to Spain. The plan didn't quite work out like that, but never mind, that's another subject. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. So therefore, Paul has proclaimed the whole will of God. And I believe the whole will of God is found in the writings of the scriptures. Simple as that. You know, if you look how much Paul wrote, you know, he, he's written these, uh, these six letters to the churches during the book of Acts, to Jewish and Gentile Christians, and he wrote another seven. Then we have all the stuff he, he said and taught in the book of Acts, let alone then we have all the other writings of the other apostles to the Jewish Christians. We have the Gospels. You know, the will of God is there. It might not mention universities. It might not mention jobs, professions, trades, Schools, churches we should attend, denominations, doesn't mention the Methodists and the Baptists and the Anglicans and the Catholics, no mention of things like that. You know, wow. But the whole will of God is found in the writings of the scriptures because the whole will of God is to do with what we are like as people. That's it's not to do where I choose to live, where I choose to work, which church I'm meant to attend. What, what are people like? That's what God, that's what God's concern is. So to sum up, if you look at it closely, the will of God for both Jewish and Gentile Christians do in the book of Acts was the same. Apart from one thing, which we'll go on to in a moment. 
for both the will of God was not specific as to what individuals did in life with respect to job, where to live, which synagogue or church to attend. It was how they lived their lives in whatever they did, wherever they did it, which was the important thing to God. The will of God for both was to do with living a holy life with the right attitude, having the correct character, doing good and avoiding evil. So what was that one thing which was different? Well, the one thing which was different and the one thing which caused a huge lot of problems during the book of Acts was circumcision. Now, the people of Israel were given this covenant of circumcision. It started way before the law of Moses. It was to do with Abraham. God introduced the covenant of circumcision with Abraham. And it went through all his descendants. And not only that, when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, not only did the Jews come out of Egypt, but a lot of pagans came out with them. And uh, during that time when they were started to wander in the wilderness, when it got to the anniversary, the first anniversary of the Exodus, God told this instruction to Moses. If any of these Gentiles want to celebrate this Passover with you, they have to be circumcised. So what you get set up in this Old Testament was that Gentiles could join the people of Israel, could come right into them and be part of them, but the men had to be circumcised. Okay? And that's what we find. Any Gentile who joined the people of Israel could go, well, eventually when the temple was built, they could go right into the inner courts of the temple. Otherwise, they had to stay in the outer courts, called the courts of the Gentiles. But they had to be circumcised. No problem at all. Those Gentiles who were circumcised and became members of the, if you like, the people of Israel were called, oh, what were they called? Dear oh me. Never mind, they were adherence to Judaism, as it says in certain translations. Okay. Now, when we get to the New Testament, there were others who went to the synagogues but weren't circumcised. These were called God fearing Gentiles. Okay, these were called God fearing Gentiles. And if you read through the book of Acts, you'll find quite a lot of these. The first Gentile that Peter went to, Cornelius, was a God fearing Gentile. In the synagogues where Paul went on the eastern half of the, Med of the Roman Empire, there were Jews and God-fearing Gentiles in those synagogues. Now, those God-fearing Gentiles weren't circumcised, but they could sit at the back of the synagogue or upstairs or behind the screen, whatever the synagogue rules were, and they could listen to the word of God being preached. All right. Fair enough. That's that's what they're that's what they did. If after some period of time they wanted to join the main body of the synagogue and become completely engulfed in Judaism, they had to be circumcised. So the reason that many of these Gentiles became God-fearing Gentiles and then the synagogue, because many of these thinking Gentiles could see the hollowness, the sham, the uselessness of pagan worship. These gods were terrible. Bacchus was always getting drunk. So if you like getting drunk, you went to the temple of Bacchus and worshipped him by getting drunk. Zeus was always seducing young maidens. So the temples of Zeus had priestesses, i.e. prostitutes. I mean, all this was a total sham. But there was this group of people called Jews who went to this simple building called a synagogue and who sang a psalm, read the scriptures, prayed and talked about the reading. And it was quite moralistic. And many Gentiles got, well, involved in this. Anyway, so quite a lot of these God-fearing Gentiles, as well as some pagan Gentiles too, became Christians. But they weren't circumcised. So the big issue was, should they be circumcised? Because after all, from the Exodus onwards, any Gentile joining the people of Israel joining the worship of Jehovah, had to be circumcised. Well, Paul said, no, no, we are justified by grace through faith. 
You Jews are justified by grace through faith. You Gentiles are justified by grace through faith. Yes, it's correct for you Jews to continue the law of Moses at the moment during the Acts period. You need to continue it. Because if you're going to be faithful witnesses to other Jews, those who don't believe in Jesus, you have to keep the law of Moses. Can you imagine it? You've got a Christian Jew living in a community. His next door neighbor may not yet believe in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior. So this Christian Jew has a little baby boy and he doesn't circumcise him. Well, his next door neighbor, who's not a Christian, would call him a pagan dog. A Gentile dog. Have nothing to do with him. And if he ate pork, well, you'd have nothing to do with him. If he didn't keep the Sabbath, he'd have nothing to do with him. So it was right and proper for the Jews of that time, of the book of the Acts, when they were witnessing not only to Gentiles, but also to their fellow Jews, to keep the law of Moses in its entirety. They had to, including circumcision and keeping of the Sabbath. That was necessary. But now... Hang on a moment. Should they or shouldn't they? So some of the Jewish Christians, they form what was called the circumcision group or the Judaizers, as they're called in other places. These were Christian Jews that were Gentiles. Sorry, that were Christians. They believed in Jesus. They believed in his death and his resurrection. They believe he died for their sins. He was the Lamb of God that took away from the sins of the world. That's absolutely fantastic. They believed all that, but they believed that Gentiles had to be circumcised. And some of these were Pharisees. You know, it says here in Acts 15, 5, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said that Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Wow. <clears throat> they were a pain in the neck, this Judaizers, this circumcision group. They, they'd been up to where Paul had gone on his first missionary journey and started upsetting some people up there upsetting Gentile Christian families where some said, well, I don't know, perhaps you ought to be circumcised. No, I don't think we should. Yes, we should. And he was causing divisions in Christian families. And Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians just before Acts chapter 15 to answer and deal with that issue. But anyway, the Jerusalem Council was called to discuss it once and for all. And having heard what the Judaizers, the circumcision group had to say, and having heard what Peter has to say, and probably Paul had to say, and Barnabas had to say. James, the Lord's brother, who was leader of the church at Jerusalem at this time, said, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted to idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. And he says, if you do this, you do well. So they, there was no need for the Gentiles to be circumcised. There was a need for the Jewish Christians to be circumcised. There's no requirement on the Gentile Christians to keep the Sabbath. There was a requirement for the Jewish Christians to keep the Sabbath. But they did ask the Gentiles to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. Why those four rules? Well, I think in our last study, we talked about when Peter went to Cornelius and he said to him, you know, it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile. And we pointed out that was not according to the law of Moses because the law of Moses didn't say that. That was the custom, the tradition added by the Pharisees. All Gentiles were unclean. That is not true. What makes a person unclean are certain things they do. If you go with a prostitute, you are unclean, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you eat the meat of strangled animals, you are unclean, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you touch a dead body, you're unclean, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you have blood on you, you're unclean, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. So, the other thing in the law of Moses is that if a person was unclean and they had contact with a person who was clean, <laughs> the, un the clean person became unclean. 
it was like contagious if you like so if if you are you're a jewish person you 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 you've got blood over you for some reason and you went home you would clean all that blood off you and go through the rites before you went into the house so the rest of your family wouldn't become unclean okay so here we have four rules these four things if you did these four four things if you ate the food polluted to idols if you indulged in sexual immorality if you ate the meat of strangled animals or if you got blood on you or drunk blood as some gentiles did you would be unclean that meant if you were a gentile christian and did this a jewish christian could not have fellowship with you because that would render them unclean and then they couldn't have fellowship with other jews whether they were the christian jews or other non-christian jews so this was this was the edict of what's called the jerusalem council a very sensible edict for that period of time okay for that period of time because if the gentiles did abstain from those things then they could have fellowship with the jewish christians and the jewish christians would have peace of mind so that's the reason behind this edict so in this is the only difference basically if you like in the will of god the difference between the jewish christians and the gentile christians do in the book of acts basically they both had to live lives that were holy they had to have good characters a generous heart they had to be the people god wanted them to be in their moral lives right but the jews still had to carry on with the law of moses included sabbath keeping and circumcision and all the food regulations and everything else the gentile christians they didn't have to be circumcised they didn't need to keep the sabbath but they were asked don't do those four things please because then we jewish christians can have fellowship with you and that went on that went on through the book of acts but when we get to the book of acts paul um well paul gets to rome in the book of acts at the end of acts acts 28 he gets to rome and he calls together the leadership of the jews as he always did and he talked to them about jesus being the christ the messiah the son of god the usual reaction was the same some did believe but some refused to believe absolutely totally refused to believe and we have seen basically if you read through the scriptures you will find it's nearly always the jewish leadership that rejected the message it was the jewish leadership that rejected jesus the high priest the chief priests captain of the temple guard most of the pharisees all of the sadducees probably Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea didn't, and that was about it. During the book of Acts, yes, they all, it was the priests and high priests and Sadducees and Pharisees that hounded Peter. Some Pharisees believed, and so did some of the police, priests believe. So there was some success. But on Paul's journeys, it was the leadership that hounded him. Oh, the, the leader of the church of Corinth believed, and he's the only leader that we, we did believe. The rest hounded Paul same in rome looks like the most senior ones refused to believe and so paul said to them go to this people and say you'll be ever hearing but never understanding you'll be ever seeing but never perceiving why because the people's heart has become calloused hard so they hardly hear with their ears and they've closed their eyes so they've closed their ears they've closed their eyes they don't listen to the arguments that paul was giving look jesus was the messiah look these are the miracles he did the blinds the blind saw the deaf heard the lame leapt the dumb spoke this is what isaiah said the old god would do when he comes to save you oh we don't want to know about that dear oh me dear oh me so he says unto them you know therefore i want you to know that god's salvation has been sent to the gentiles and they will listen this is you like this if you like is the end of the age for israel as a nation and it wasn't long after this that they were destroyed as a nation by the romans who came in destroyed jerusalem the temple 
killed many of them and carted many others off as slaves. So what's God going to do? He's got these people, his people, whose heart is so hard. They don't listen. They don't, they don't see the significance of the miracles that were being done. So what's going to happen? Well, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to him. So now we're going to enter a new period, the post acts period. And what we shall find in this post acts period is, as far as God's concerned, there's no such thing as Jew or Gentile. You know, the nation of Israel, maybe as a nation and the leadership had hardened his heart and it's closed its mind to the things of Christ, but individual Jews could still become Christians, as individual Gentiles could still become Christians. And now they are one. They are one in a way in which they were not one during the book of Acts. During the book of Acts, we saw there were these differences, circumcision, Sabbath keeping, keeping the law of Moses for the Jews, the Gentiles, not bothering with circumcision or the Sabbath, but keeping those four things to do with ceremonial cleanliness. The Jews in the book of Acts had all the advantages. They were first. They were all the leaders. But not now, not any longer. Um, but anyway, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. And during those two years, at the beginning, Paul wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon. Towards the end of the two years, he wrote Philippians and he was released. And he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. And then he was rearrested to Timothy and in prison. So what have these to say about the will of God? Are there any changes? Um, you know, what is it? Um, is God still primarily concerned with our moral character, the hearts of Christians and what they're like? Well, we'll look at that in our next and final study.